Good afternoon and welcome to the Museum of Fine Arts Boston's Summer Museum Careers Today panel discussion. My name is Dahlia Habib Linson. I'm the Head of Academic Engagement at the MFA. Joining me today are many colleagues, some who have helped organize today's discussion from our school programs section as well as our teen programs and some who will be presenting. I'd like to thank all of them for their collaboration and participation. My co-moderator is Sydney Bowden. And we are very pleased to be joined today by over 230 attendees, many from the New England area, some from across the country, and even some from outside of the United States. So before getting into the goals for today's discussion, we'd like to share a little bit about the structure of our conversation. So the program will feature five short presentations by MFA staff members, followed by time for questions and discussion. And you may have gathered by now that we're using a webinar format, which means that while you'll be able to see and hear presenters, they will not be able to see or hear you. And although we can't see or hear you, we very much welcome your participation in the form of questions and comments. So following the presentations, we invite you to submit questions by using the button at the bottom of your screen that looks like a speech bubble in the Zoom toolbar. Questions and comments will be visible to presenters, though not to attendees, and we promise to answer as many as we can. If you can direct your question to a specific presenter, that would be really helpful. Finally, please note that today's session is being recorded and captioning will be available at a later date to coincide with the recording. So our objectives for this afternoon's discussion are three. The first is to provide a glimpse into the many professions that exist within an art museum like the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and learn from the wonderful individuals in these roles. The second is to explore how the current COVID-19 pandemic may impact the work in art museums, both now and in the future. Our third goal is really to provide a space for questions and conversation about museum work. So some of you may be here because you might be interested, generally speaking, about work in museums. Um, some of you might be interested in very specific types of museum positions and others in specific internships or in other opportunities at the MFA. So please know that today's session is not designed to serve as a job or internship fair per se. Um, we would also like to point out that although our internship program will operate at a slightly smaller scale this fall, we do anticipate being able to grow it by the end of the uh, year and certainly into the spring and beyond. So although you might not hear about specific open positions, what you will hear about this afternoon is the amazing work of representatives from a range of professions at the MFA, from community engagement and development to curatorial registration and internships. Finally, we want to acknowledge that this is certainly a very challenging time from the current global health pandemic and related economic crisis to the heightened social tensions that are a result of ongoing racial injustice in the United States and across the globe. Without a doubt, these are really complex issues that have and will continue to impact cultural organizations. And while we can't promise to have all the answers to all the questions that may emerge this afternoon, we do recognize the importance of creating a space for open dialogue about museum work in light of these challenges. So we thank you again very much for joining us. And um, we look forward in this dialogue to conveying some ideas and to hearing your thoughts and questions. So with that, I'm really delighted to turn things over to my friend and colleague, Monica Garcia. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Super excited to be here, um, as it is my first time being on uh, a digital platform talking about myself. <laughs> but I just wanted to quickly just uh, tell you guys a little bit about um, what I'm doing here at the museum as a community arts organizer, um, with a little bit of a background in education and also designing. Um, 
at this, as a community arts organizer, I work with multiple educators, which we call liaisons, who are basically the, the, the people who bridge the gap between the Museum of Fine Arts and the organizations that we work with. And I also work um, in terms of being part of the whole artist project that I will go over in the next few slides. Um, uh, currently, right, what, we're, what I actually do is I help out with um, basically create new relationships and help sustain new relationships within our communities. Our communities in Boston are very vast and very multicultural. Um, one thing's for sure that I've noticed is that, you know, as a person who comes from a very multicultural home, it was actually very, very important for me to have this type of connection to the arts, to the people that we serve as well. Um, and the whole relationship that we have with the Museum of Fine Arts um, and uh, communities, we are, we, we tr really try to sustain these relationships going forward. So it's not just a today situation, we're looking in terms of creating a strong, sustainable relationship within the next few years, and so on and so on. Can go over the next slide. <laughs> Uh, so here you see that um, I ha we have a few images here to represent a few things. Um, currently, as I, as I have said, I work with, uh, I manage a few of our liaisons. Currently we have about uh, 10 um, with 12, with two new organizations. So right now we have 12. In the past we've had about 10. Um, and these organizations are basically youth, um, after school youth programs. Um, especially for communities that are that don't have a very high quality arts program and as a museum and as a representative we really strive to make sure that they have a connection to the MFA so a lot of our liaisons are part partnered up with their organization so each one has their own organizations where they built the trust and relationship and, and bring in the education to the organization. So a lot of our um, partnerships are of uh, the Boys and Girls Club, as well as um, standalone partnerships that we work with currently. So the liaisons, they go in, they um, bring in the um, art experience with their plans, with like uh, new projects and such. So it's such a great thing that they have this relationship with KG, uh, kids ages from 6 to 12. That is primarily the ages that we work with. Um, so it's a wonderful thing. Um, they also bridge the gap between not only going into this community and also um, uh, basically uh, creating a, a, a project, but also an art making activity that is inspired by the MFA and uh, encyclopedic collection as well. So that's where that relationship starts. And um, we also have a thing called the Artist Project that, ha that I had mentioned before, but we have a call to artists every single year. And we have a panel of judges that, are uh, that, that uh, include you know, colleagues that work at the MFA, but also community leaders. Um, and uh, we, they pick, so they, they go through, we have an art, <laughs> a call to artist program. So um, we have, so basically they pick up um, and choose the artist. Um, with that artist, whoever is, is uh, chosen, they uh, work with the liaisons for the next upcoming year, um, inspired by a vision that they have for the artist project. Um, so we just currently, we are still, usually we have the artist project actually displayed during the the, the springtime in May, but because of COVID, that's also been um, that's also been a challenge because of social distancing, um, and then also having to deal with another wonderful artist that we had chosen for the the upcoming year, which starts from fall to early spring. So I'll go a little bit into that a little bit later on, but as you can see, there's there's a relationship again with the liaison as well as with the artist who comes into the partnerships and bring in um, the supplies and also the art making activity that is associated with this very huge collaborative art installation at the end of the year. It's a wonderful moment for kids to like see their artwork in a museum, be part of that museum, 
I mean, it's just a wonderful experience for a, a six to 12 year old kid to actually see that they've, they've got their artwork put up in a, in a major institution in a very major hall. Next, next slide. So as you can see, um, again, from fall to like early spring, the artists who's been chosen for that year, uh, and as well as the liaison, they work very collaboratively in, in a matter of visits. And um, as you can see, there's a few examples of what we've been doing for the past few years. Um, so after the very, I believe from like April to May, usually we have a huge opening reception where the kids get to see from all 10 to 12, or 12 organizations right now and um, partnerships that we have right now, they get to see their, um, their beautiful art displayed on this wall, which is at the Landy, Lindy, family, um, Lindy Family Gallery, which is really huge. It's really highly trafficked. They have an opening reception with their families and the organization leaders that come in. They, they have fun, eat, have a huge um, reception as well as like a, um, you know, a, a showing. So, it's such a wonderful experience. And as you can see on the very right, um, we just recently had Mindful Mandela's by Sneha Shrezda, who is a local Boston artist, um, as well as uh, Elemental Hillary from Hillary Selson, who has done this a few years ago. So it's a beautiful exhibition where kids really get to see themselves as being part of the museum. And that's really exactly what we want our communities to feel. We want them to feel like they are part of the MFA. We want them to feel like they are, um, that they see themselves at the MFA. And oh, this is a huge part of our community engagement um, goals. Next slide. Um, so, Thinking about it, all of this, as I mentioned before, we're a little bit, because we're a little bit at a very weird moment right now because of coronavirus. Um, as I said before, we usually would have our opening reception on, around like, like late May area. Um, but because of that, that had to be moved up. And, uh, and for this year's artist project, it will definitely have to be, it will happen. It just needs to kind of move forward. And it's not just the artist project that this has kind of like impacted, but also the idea of going into our communities and teaching and bringing in the MFA to them as well as bringing them to the MFA as well. So we had to really think about ways to educate and kind of like spread out to our communities. Um, so there's a few ways that a lot of the liaisons have, have, uh, have created and this is uncharted territory a lot of us have never done this before so it's a very exciting moment and it's really amazing to see just how creative our educators are i mean we couldn't do this without them and the passion that they have for the communities and and, and you know the passion that they share with us so as an example, on the very left, you'll see uh, pre-recorded videos. Those are some of the things that we're also we've also been doing. Um, you know, it's a wonderful experience because this gives families the opportunity to actually check in when they want to. Because as we know, the weather's getting a lot better. No kid wants to stay at home and looking at Zoom. Let's be honest. You know, so this is a wonderful experience for kids and families to engage together and they don't have to be, they don't have to show up on time to, to you know, like a live Zoom session as you see on the very um, right slide where um, you'll see some posters, some liaisons have created posters to actually tell families and friends um, with the with uh, coordination with the organizations that they work with, they're, they're liaisoning with. Um, and that way kids and families know how to, know when to actually um, uh, engage with the liaison itself. And I do love live Zoom classes because we find that in this moment in time where normalcy is not there and we're going through a very racial, uh, uh, racial divide at this moment in time, um, a lot of civil rights issues we're also facing and a lot of our communities are people of color and black people in general. So a lot of liaisons are thinking about creating um, moments for kids to actually express themselves, to talk about these issues, because we find that it's also important to actually go um, and um, actually face and, and experience 
um, and share our experiences in general. So it's a really great uh, system where we've created different types of uh, programs as well. So lives and sessions are great for kids to engage one on one with liaisons. Um, pre recorded videos are great for timing purposes. Next slide. Um, and some liaisons have actually worked with uh, other organizations and keep in mind every organization we're realizing because of COVID, they are working very differently um, and they're going about it very differently. Some aren't doing any pre-recorded videos with the liaison, some are not doing any live sessions, maybe they're doing a little bit of both. You'll see that there's a Facebook post in there, one of our liaisons from the Charleston Boys and Girls Club. Every week she does a Facebook post where she engages with the community, puts in a link so that the kids can kids and families can actually link into these videos and take a look at a bunch of our videos at the MFA um, in regards to like insta art installations or an artist uh, artist talk or an artist interview. So it's a great experience for, um, for them to actually look into uh, job and career possibilities because when I was a kid, I had no idea <laughs> the museum had these many jobs. So it's a great thing that you guys are here listening. Um, the same thing with Instagram, there's that experience as well. And we've noticed because we're, we're working, we're uh, flying the plane as we're building it, um, Instagram's a very different uh, way of systeming, of posting. So um, very, very different uh, subjects. And we also have to deal with like creative departments and having to make sure that everything looks MFA certified. Next, next slide. And here you'll see that we are also thinking about also bringing back to our communities. So as you see, Orchard Garden School is one of our, our uh, uh, new partnerships that we made just this year. We are thinking about ways of actually extending as much as we can, um, you know, within this financial crisis, we know that it's affecting our families. It's also affecting everybody, I'm sure, as well as us. But we are trying to find ways to actually uh, bring in some sort of magic or positivity, even if it's just a little bit to our organizations and our partnerships, um, including our communities in Boston, uh, Boston Public Schools, as well as our organizations here. So you can see, you can see the art kits that we, we put on ourselves and we go out to our partnerships and we drop it off. And that way that they can either do it themselves or they can work with a liaison side by side on a one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of uh, instructional time. So yeah. I just wanted to, sorry, <laughs> just wanted to say, I know that there's plenty of information here, but we, we really do find that our organizations and our communities are completely uh, a big part of our, uh, a chunk of our, um, um, of our experience at the MFA. And we see that we, we, are, we are definitely putting up and we're striving to make sure that we are taking care of everyone and um, really showing up at this moment in time. Thank you so much, Monica. And now we'll turn it over to Blair. And I also want to say thank you, Monica. The work that you and the liaisons are doing in our community is so important now more than ever during COVID. So it's really great to hear about everything that you're doing, and I applaud that. Um, and I want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us today. I'm Blair Hollis. I'm the head of corporate partnerships at the MFA. I've been at the museum for just over nine years now, and I actually started um, as an intern in the contemporary art department with one of the other panelists who's on the call. And um, my first job at the museum was selling tickets at the front desk. <laughs> and I've worked my way up to the head of corporate over the past nine years. Um, what's great is I've been on the corporate team for five years now, but um, being exposed to the whole museum through working in the front lines has been so critical to the work that I've been doing. So just to say, every job that you have during your career builds on top of one another and you never know what's going to end up being the most valuable experience. So I still think back to when I was selling tickets and memberships and everything that I learned through that. So what my job entails now is that I work on the fundraising team. And I'm just gonna explain a little bit about what we do because honestly, I didn't really learn about what fundraising or development did until I was in graduate school. So I'm just gonna assume then that others don't know too much either. And um, 
So something I, I knew sort of in the back of my mind, but never really thought about um, as I was an art student and then an art history um, in, uh, student in college was that museums are giant businesses, right? So we have a lot of operational costs. At an organization like the MFA, while we're a not-for-profit, we do have to bring in enough money in order to break even and cover all of our expenses. So for an organization of our size with about 500 staff members, 500,000 objects that we need to conserve for the future, um, that means we spend about $85 million each year. It's a lot. And about a third to a half of that is covered by donated dollars. So that's funny that we get from companies, from foundations, from individuals, from membership sales. Another portion of our revenue comes from um, what we call earned revenue. And so that's ticket sales when people shop and they dine and they park at the museum. And during COVID, we have no earned revenue. So right now the museum is relying solely on donated dollars. Uh, so development is, is really important in that sense. Um, and now more so than ever. And that will probably be the case for the next few years, especially as we can only allow um, a certain number of people into the building when we reopen. So bringing on the fundraiser, uh, being on the fundraising team, we have about 40 people in development and then about three who work in corporate sponsorship. And specifically what I do is I'm a salesperson and what I sell is the museum and I'm selling it to companies to try to get them to invest and underwrite our programming. So that can be anything that we're doing, exhibition sponsorships, um, community events, the Community Arts Initiative, some of the things that Monica just spoke about are underwritten by corporate uh, companies within the area. So it's a great role if you like people, if you like events, if you're interested in marketing, if you like writing. Oh, and let's go to the next slide so you can start seeing some pictures. Thank you, Delia. Um, so what does that look like? So here are some of the brands that I currently work with. We have about 120 corporate partners at the MFA, and we have two programs. We have a corporate membership program, um, which allows people to have private events at the museum and get their employees in for free. So what we call employee engagement. And then also sponsorship, which is all about marketing and exposure through the museum. So for my sponsorship job, what that looks like is I go out, I find companies who I think would be a great fit for something that the museum's doing. I put together a proposal, I go and present or I have a lunch with them, convince them why their company needs to be involved in whatever we're doing. Then I work on the contract with them, negotiate that, and then I work on executing it. So that means if someone's sponsoring an event, I have to be at the event with them. I help them you know, give their remarks in front of an audience, um, make sure that their logo's in the right place, and make sure that they get the value out of the partnership that we promised them that they would. So what I love about that is it means that every day is different, and I also never know what each day will bring. Uh, a little bit different now in COVID, it's all happening at home, but there's still a lot of variety in the kinds of tasks that I'm doing. Um, so the pictures that you see on the right of your screen are from Bank of America's recent sponsorship of Ancient Nubia Now, which was the biggest exhibition that we had in the fall of 2019. And we had, I think it was around 150,000 people come to see the show, which was a huge success for us. And you can see pictures of the opening reception with all of our high level donors and our board of trustees. And then also some of the marketing that we did in the MBTA and the subway cars around Boston. So for Bank of America, that means that they get exposure, um, they get to talk to our audiences, and they get their logo out through a community organization. And here are a couple other examples. Tell you if you go to the next slide. Um, some other companies that I work with really focus on community-driven events. So on the left, you'll see images of Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase's sponsorship of Sunset Cinema, which are outdoor film screenings on the front um, lawn of the museum. So that's what you're, you're looking at the side of the MFA, big bushes, and those are all hundreds of people um, together to see the film. And Chase, in addition to providing financial support, also helped us with lawn games. They gave away free popcorn and chairs and blankets to moviegoers. So there can be really fun, creative ways to figure out how to partner with these companies. And then on the right, um, that's a Facebook or Instagram, I think Facebook post from MLK Day a few years ago. 
And Citizens Bank has sponsored our community celebration for more than 20 years. And we get about 10,000 people to the museum on MLK Day, and it's an incredible day. Citizens Bank underwrites the whole thing. They're also on site handing out free hot chocolate to people waiting outside in the cold to get in and goodie bags. And then they also help us make sure that we have a civic partnership with the mayor of Boston. So what you're seeing is um, a picture of Mayor Marty Walsh, who is coloring in a mural that was designed by a community organization called Artists for Humanity. And I'm very excited to see that Sydney is wearing a shirt from that organization. Um, and they're a great local partner of ours. So corporate partnerships can really help us amplify other relationships as well. So Citizen supports both Artists for Humanity and the MFA. And the next slide, another new kind of relationship that we've been working on, which is unique, is with Uniqlo. Um, and I hope you all know the Japanese retailer. So they started sponsoring the MFA a couple of years ago in 2017, and we designed a partnership for 10 years that's all about promoting Japanese art and culture. So they sponsor a number of programs at the MFA, including our Japanese Film Festival, in which we show really wonderful new film coming out of Japan in Boston. We do a free opening night so anyone can come, and we had a DJ and um, Japanese snacks and art making um, this past year and the year before. And then we also have a retail partnership with them where they use images from the MFA's collection on Uniqlo products. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the screen um, are some product. So you can see Hokusai's Great Wave and um, that is the, in the MFA's collection. So we license that to Uniqlo to print on t-shirts and product that is distributed around the world. And what's really wonderful for the MFA is that our branding is associated. So if you look, in the label, you see the MFA and Uniqlo brands together. So it's helping us reach more audiences internationally. Um, some people who probably maybe would have walked into a Uniqlo store, but would have never had the opportunity to visit the MFA. So it helps us elevate our brand. And then, so what are we doing during COVID? <laughs> so as you saw from all the images, it's um, a lot of my job is big events, bringing people together. Um, that's also the kinds of things that sponsors really love because they're super interested in getting their brand in front of as many people as possible. So during COVID, we've been thinking about how to shift that. And of course, virtual events and virtual exhibitions have become really successful as a new vehicle for us to reach new audiences and also help um, provide our sponsors who are making these programs possible with some visibility. So last week we had an incredibly successful Juneteenth, as Monica mentioned, and um, that was made possible by Chase. And so you can see their little logo on the slides. And I think in total across all of the platforms, we reached more than 12,000 people, which is really amazing because in person last year, we had around 5,000. So new digital offerings are a really important way for us to reach even more audiences than we would have in person. And then on the right, that's um, a screenshot of a new digital exhibition for uh, Writing the Future, Basquiat and the Hip Hop Generation, which Liz Mansell is going to speak more about. But um, you can see the Bank of America logo. So they have sponsored the exhibition. And then during COVID, you know, we decided to change up how we were recognizing their support on the web page to make it more visible, since this is the only way that people can access the exhibition right now. So I hope um, all of you will consider thinking about a career in development. It's much more fun to raise money than it might sound. Thank you so much, Blair. That was wonderful. Thank you. So I'd love to introduce my colleague, Liz Munsell. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be with you and um, such an honor uh, to be on this panel with um, so many who make our work and curatorial uh, reach the publics that it needs to reach and actually happen um, in a logistical sense as well. Um, we could not at all put together exhibitions if Jill didn't get the paintings to us or if Jahari didn't help with the logistics of the exhibition schedule and reaching um, publics outside of our walls and if Monica didn't bring all those amazing kids to see the show um, when they're visiting the MFA and Dahlia and her whole team is so integral to, to this as well. So, um, and if Blair didn't make, make the money, obviously. <laughs> so 
So thanks, everyone. Um, you can go to the next slide, Dahlia. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, my path to curatorial. Uh, I um, studied uh, my graduate work in Chile. After completing a Fulbright there, I decided um, to stay on and complete my graduate studies in Latin American studies and cultural studies um, at the Universidad de Chile. Um, because Latin American art was my main area of focus and I was also trying to um, avoid the incredibly high costs of um, graduate school in the US, um, which I successfully did. And I also was able to um, complete really, really direct primary research um, by being in the ground um, in Latin America rather than studying these art, um, contemporary art and, and artists um, from afar and from from the US. Um, and so while I was in graduate school, I worked in a very small arts nonprofit called Espacio G. Um, and as soon as I got back to the States um, in 2009, so I'm gonna date myself um, as, as, as uh, Blair's former supervisor when she was an intern um, in 2009, uh, when I came back from graduate school, I began applying for jobs in the arts sector and uh, moved from this tiny arts nonprofit to our uh, wonderful and, and mammoth um, institution, the MFA. Um, in my first years at the MFA, as uh, basically a curatorial assistant, I didn't have a lot of opportunities to curate exhibitions um, within our walls um, until later when I was promoted to assistant curator. Um, so in the beginning of my career, um, this is now you know 10 years ago, I uh, curated independently at institutions around uh, the city, uh, including Harvard University, where I was a visiting curator, Tufts, um, and other um, academic institutions throughout um, throughout the city. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Diane. Thanks. Uh, so we were asked to kind of give uh, either a, a day of um, picture of a, a typical day and explain a little bit about what we do. And I want to make sure that everybody knows that curating contemporary art is absolutely about hanging paintings on walls and um, creating selections of artworks uh, that tell a certain thematic story. Um, but it's also about connecting audiences with the type of work that contemporary artists do, uh, which is really runs the gamut from more traditional types of painting and sculpture to live performance art um, and other multimedia art. Um, so there's many contemporary artists out there who are working with musicians and producers and thinking about television as an avenue. Um, it really runs the gamut. So uh, around 2009, I was asked to um, generate the MFA's uh, first performance art program. And um, I looked back to the artists that I knew from my networks in Latin America, trying to think a little bit critically about who from Latin America gets to show work in the US as part of our, our international contemporary art world that is pretty much exclusively English speaking artists and their representatives. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I was bringing in artists who didn't speak English and so that publics in the US could have access to their work as well. And um, because I'm fluent in Spanish and that was a skill that I had um, to offer. So uh, one of the first artists that I invited as part of our new performance art program was Regina Jose Galindo, who is from Guatemala City. And um, this is what one day in front of the Lindy family wing looked like um, when she drove a, an SUV up to the Lindy thing, family wing parking lot and our facilities and janitorial teams began to dismantle it around her as she sat in the passenger seat. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Daya. Until she was standing in this vehicle, at, um, which was sort of a shell of itself. Um, next slide, please. And the work called Big Bang um, was aimed to be a reflection about the economic meltdown in 2008, uh, which uh, had obviously its epicenter in Detroit and the auto industry and how that um, meltdown reverberated throughout the entire world, creating a worldwide economic crisis. Uh, so I think that this work um, really resonates for us today, um, facing the economic crisis that we are all in together. 
uh, now. And I wanted to bring it up as an example also of the challenges moving forward working with contemporary artists. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, as you can see in this photo, uh, one of our bigger facilities guys is holding up the artist uh, and gathered around her are all the amazing um, MFA staff, staff members who I'll mention whose work is often visible and they are so integral to making um, everything we do possible um, at the MFA. Um, and so that kind of closeness, um, sorry, you can go back, go back just really quickly, that kind of closeness, togetherness with contemporary artists. Um, I have real questions about what that will look like moving forward. And of course, I want to think through um, things like maybe trying to commission um, an online series of performance and um, to be able to continue um, to support artists who work in these, these live formats. Okay, so next, next slide. Thanks. Um, so, the upcoming exhibition, uh, which I'm giving you a little sneak preview of in my, my backdrop here, my Zoom backdrop, um, the upcoming exhibition that I wanted to talk about just briefly is Writing the Future Basquiat in the Hip Hop Generation, which uh, Blair touched upon. Um, this is important work um, at the core of the show because it's a portrait um, that Basquiat made of himself and two of his peers um, associated with graffiti and hip hop culture, Ramel Z and Toxic. Um, this exhibition is the first um, in, in history, as far as we know, um, to draw important connections between Basquiat and his um, fellow peer artists of color um, who have um, very much been erased from the narratives around his work um, to date. Can go to the next slide. Um, I think that Jill maybe will dive more into this particular work, um, but this is another um, amazing piece, one of the many portraits that Basquiat made of his friends and fellow artists um, that we'll be featuring in a room dedicated to them. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, as we were shutting down on March 13th, um, to uh, prepare for the, the coming shelter, months of, now months of shelter in place. This is what the gallery looked like. Um, these are actually paper and cardboard uh, mock-ups of the, of the works as we kind of prepared um, to install alarms and um, to, in order, we're working with these large scale mock-ups to avoid having to work too much um, around these very high value important artworks. Uh, so this is the state that we left things in and um, we shut down on Friday. We we're, we're due to install on Monday um, and we are very much, I'm happy to say, looking forward to uh, picking back up this work in the fall um, when we will open the show. Um, so next slide. Um, this is what the floor plan, and now in the meantime, um, we, I'm working very closely with our designers, um, with Jill, uh, with our exhibition staff, um, and of course leadership team um, to rethink this exhibition and ensure that it is a safe environment for our visitors when they come back uh, through our doors. So this is what the floor plan looked like pre-COVID. And if you can just go to the last slide, please. Um, and this is what we're thinking um, that it will look like um, when we open. So we've removed some key walls um, and in order to create a more um, open um, floor plan, um, we have uh, basically cut down the checklist in very slight ways that I don't think affects the overall story that we're trying to tell. Um, and we're continuing to be in conversation about um, socially distanced exhibition design and um, making sure that we can uh, have a really, really engaging space, which was kind of like a loud, crowded environment um, and it's the original vision for it. Um, while of course, um, adhering to all of the protocols that are gonna enable us to, to be uh, together in these spaces safely. Um, so thank you so much everyone um, and Dahlia for organizing and I will look forward to everyone's questions in a bit. Thank you so much, Liz. Wonderful. Let me go to the slides. So I'd love to invite Jill Kennedy Kernahan to join us. 
Thank you. Hi, um, so I'm Jill Kennedy Kernahan. I'm the head registrar at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, I am, I guess, the representative from the collections care division, which involves um, the registrar's office, all the conservators, mount makers, and preparators, as well as um, the people who take care of our storage areas, both on and off site. Um, if we could have the next slide. I really miss the museum a lot. As Liz says, and everybody said, it's been several years or several months since we've been there. Um, this is a picture of my desk and it's like, I just love the view. So I thought I'd have you guys, you know, see some pretty museum pictures while I told you a little bit about how I got to where I am at the museum. <laughs> um, so I went to a small college in Ohio and I was an art history major there. I knew it wasn't a powerhouse and that if I wanted to work in museums, I was going to have to find some other way to, um, to get involved in a museum. I did an internship when I was in college at the Carnegie Museums in Pittsburgh. And they told me there that, um, that I couldn't meet the registrar because she was always traveling with the artwork around the world. And I thought, well, that's the perfect job for me. So um, when I moved to Boston, I was lucky enough to get a job at the gift shop and worked there for several months until I found, um, until they advertised a position in the registrar's office and I was lucky enough to get that. Um, when I first joined the registrar's office, which I will admit, Liz, <laughs> I'm even more than you. I've been at the museum for about 27 years. Um, when I joined, you were trained on the job and they said you could not go to school to be a registrar. But in fact, now, uh, as probably many of you know, um, there is a you know, museum studies program um, that you can go to to sort of become, get that initial training. Um, much of that includes an internship and we host many interns in our office um, to sort of get them up to speed on what it means to be a registrar in a major museum. Um, so the next slide. However, many of you may not know what a registrar does. So in general, in the field, um, the registrar is responsible for documentation of this collection and storage of the collection. So we keep track of who owns the work. Um, if someone lends something to us, we need to have those details. When we buy something, we have to make sure we've acquired it properly. Um, we keep track of the location of the objects within the building or when they're out on loan um, around the world. And then we also take care of the insurance of the collections for the fine arts policy. Um, we make sure that objects that are loaned to us are insured properly. And also, again, when we lend our objects around the world. The second part of our uh, remit is transportation of the collection. So uh, whether it's you know, a, moving to us or from our collection, um, uh, out, uh, out around the world, we take care of how the artwork is going to be packed, um, how will it be moved around the world, and how will the artwork be cared for when it's on view. So these are things that I also then take care of here at this building. So next slide. So what is a registrar at the MFA? We have six registrars um, in our office. Um, one registrar takes care of the acquisitions that the, uh, the objects that we add into our collection. And uh, it, it, as an encyclopedic museum, her job is so varied because she's bringing in everything from antiquities and you know, these fragile Egyptian relics to uh, things that um, the contemporary department is purchasing every day, which are just these um, you know, very um, delicate, in some ways, um, contemporary pieces that you know, could be a hundred a hundred pieces in one object. Um, so it's, it's a, quite an interesting job and she gets a lot of uh, exposure to very many different types of pieces. We have one registrar or several registrars actually who send out loans from our collection. We have a touring program. We put together exhibitions and we send those out to various institutions. And then we have objects in our collection which we loan out to individual exhibitions. Um, we have loans to the museum and that's what I do and I'm working with Liz closely on the Basquiat show. Um, but I would say the biggest thing about the being a registrar at the MFA is the collaborative nature of it. Um, we work with 
almost everybody in the museum, although I realize like Monica, we've never worked together, but um, so we work with the conservation and all the, um, the curators about their exhibition, the designers, the project managers, the carpenters who build the cases, um, the security people, the installers. Um, I work with the lenders. Um, we talk to borrowers in museums around the world. Um, and we work with vendors around the world. There's an entire fine arts shipping network that's um, out there that we work with. And that's really fascinating. And actually, we could do a whole other um, program on, you know, that being an, a, an opportunity for careers as well. Um, so next slide, I guess. So I thought I'd talk a little bit or was thought I should talk a little bit about COVID and my job as and how it, COVID has changed my job a little bit. Um, as Liz said, when Basquiat, um, when we closed, Basquiat is, is in the gallery. It's literally sitting there. There are crates um, just waiting to be unpacked. And, um, you know, the project's on hold, obviously, and there are going to be many changes. Um, but there are also a lot of changes in our industry right now because we don't know how to ship artwork anymore. Uh, you know, there are no flights into Logan. We used to be able to, to just take an, uh, you know, a crate, send it to the airport, and it could go anywhere in the world. And now we just don't have that ability anymore. There are fewer trucks on the road, so we don't have that ability anymore. And we also can't send couriers with our artwork because people cannot travel or don't want to travel. So a lot of the things that we take for granted in, in the industry, in the registrar field, um, just simply aren't happening anymore. And we're going to have to navigate how to do that. I mentioned um, the collaboration within the museum, but the one thing about COVID that's been interesting is the collaboration outside of the museum and the fact that, that registrars all over the country and, and all over the world are sort of getting together and talking about how are we going to solve these problems. And prior to this, We'd all been so busy, we hadn't been able to think about that. And now it's really just been a very interesting time where we're, we're connecting, we're helping each other and trying to come up with new processes. Um, so next slide. So as Liz mentioned, this is the, the painting. I just thought that this was a good illustration, one of how interesting the job can be, but then also how it was affected by um, the shutdown and, and the, the, the pandemic. So Liz is, um, knows that she wants this painting for the exhibition and um, it's a wonderful piece. And it took you a long time to find it, I think. You couldn't figure out who the lender was. And so, but you know, this is, this is Liz's part of it. She knows she wants this work and she went out to try to find it and she finally figured out who it was. But given that it was a, you know, a contemporary work and it, it was, it's this interesting international conundrum where the Swiss gallery helped us figure out who the lender is. We don't know where he's from, but he has an Italian conservator and an Italian insurance company as well to tell us that it's in a German location. So it's just sort of one of these like, um, you know, puzzles that we had to put together in order to get this work here. Now, as I mentioned, it was coming from a German location with an Italian conservator who wanted to travel with the artwork, but she is from Milan. And so it was shut down and she could not travel with the artwork. So we ended up having to send one of our conservators over to Germany to pick it up. But the week that she went to pick it up was the week that COVID just blew up there. So she brought it back to the building and then immediately had to go into quarantine lockdown. And now it's just sitting there waiting. So we're hoping that at some point when we do finally start the show or start to install the show that the conservator will be able to come over and examine the piece and continue with the installation. But at this point, we don't even know when that's going to be and whether we'll be allowed to even have visitors in the country. So anyways, just an illustration of sort of one of the things that we end up having to deal with and um, how it became so much more complicated um, with COVID. And I think that's it for now, but I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jill. That was fantastic. Super interesting. I feel like we could have every one of you on for um, a long, as long as an hour and have a lot of really exciting questions. So thank you so much. 
So I'm super pleased to welcome our last speaker for today, Jahari Ortega, who is a superstar intern at the MFA. So over to you, Jahari. Hi, everyone. My name is Jahari. Um, I am the Souls Grown Deep intern. And I like to say my home base is exhibitions, and I'll explain that later. Um, but I am a rising senior at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, and I started my internship in September. Um, next slide, Thank you. Um, so I am the Souls Grown Deep intern, um, and so this Souls Grown Deep is a foundation um, that is based in Atlanta and is all about, um, I wrote it here, but it's all about um, documenting and preserving and um, kind of conserving the art of African American artists from the South. And recently they added an internship as a part of their foundation and the internship um, is three interns and you can see myself and the two other interns this year um, from different places in the country that we are all interns of color and college and we work at our local art museums. Um, and so the internship was just supposed to be for the school year and Souls Grown Deep pays us and kind of communicates with us throughout the internship about um, our roles as students of color and why we're doing what we're doing and we get to know a little bit about the artists and the foundation um, and we meet each other. This is us on a boat in G's Bend, and I can talk about that later as well. But because of the um, pandemic and the museum being shut down, the Souls Grown Deep contacted all three of our museums and asked to keep us over the summer, which I'm very grateful for because um, I'm working on a few projects with the museum, one of them being Basquiat, and I was really hoping to see it, you know, come through and be all beautiful and actually walk through the galleries before um, I have to like transition to something else. Um, so yeah, next slide please. So like I said, exhibitions is kind of like my home base at the museum, um, but my internship is about learning the breadth of the museum. So some of my projects are all over the place. These are a few examples. So I've been in textile conservation. Um, I've been in musical instruments. Um, I've been in the design department. I've worked with curatorial, um, public programming, interpretation, community engagement. And these projects that I work on vary um, in terms of my participation, but they're all places that I've had really deep conversations and learned so much. Some of these departments I had no idea even existed before I met the person that was working there. Um, next slide. So this is just um, me and the interns and some of the artists that Souls Grown Deep um, has their artwork. So a part of the internship is um, us, the interns, going to Atlanta and going to Alabama and learning more about the foundation, learning more about their mission to support um, Southern African American artists. And we meet some of them. And this trip was like one of the most reassuring trips um, that I've ever been on because it really um, kind of confirmed why I was interested in museums and why like, you know, as a person of color, as a student of color, I wanna advocate and like be a part of the change and the growth of museums. Um, and so I like to say that I came to the museum with the G's Ben quilt ac um, acquisitions. Um, so the museum got some quilts from G's Bend um, and I was lucky enough to go to G's Bend and meet some of these quilters, which was amazing. Um, and that's in the lower left-hand corners was me at one of their houses um, and they just whipped out like 50 quilts and started laying them on the bed. And it was really, it was really, really great. Um, to kind of meet the artists, talk to them, get to know about like why it is important for them to have their work in museums and, you know, get to talk about why they feel that my role is important. So when I came back to the museum, not only could I, you know, talk to conservation about the quilts and like, you know, give suggestions or recommendations about, you know, how we care for them and whether we wash them or not um, and things like that, but also 
throughout the museum, like kind of internally kind of feeling like an advocate for these artists um, in conversations that I'm a part of throughout the museum. Um, next slide, please. So um, the interns before this all happened all got together and one of the questions we were all asked was, what does the future of museums look like? And also, you know, keeping in mind COVID and things like that, you know, us, you know, our generation being the next generation that are gonna have Jill's job in the future and Blair's job and Monica's job and Liz's job, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to learn from everyone, but also think about what like technology do we use and what um, ways of communication do we use, um, not only to move forward in general, but now we have something completely different to think about, which is COVID and social distancing and, you know, other issues that may arise in the future. So these are just some incomplete thoughts that I had um, about, you know, next generation and like the future of museums. Some of them, like I mentioned here, are virtual reality, you know, I am learning about technology and, you know, having experienced different um, things like in school with like virtual museums and things like that, that being a possibility with the technology, you know, social media presence, that's how a lot of people are getting information right now. Also, um, the design team, like all of their process work and Liz, you shared some of the plans and things like that. So if people can't come to the museum, how do we have access to some of the visuals and get an experience of like what it would be like to visit the museum. So possibly making some of those plans or even 3D mockups available online. And also kind of what Monica was talking about earlier, um, interactive classes and events and stuff like that. Um, and um, public art, I'm a big fan. I'm a sculptor myself and I, I really hope that the museum can kind of expand out of its, out of its walls. And we have um, the mural project. If, you go to the museum website, we're actually working on a public art piece um, now in, in relationship to the Basquiat exhibit, which I'm really excited about. And I hope that um, that's something that we as a museum continue to do, because if somebody can't necessarily go to the museum, but they can walk around Boston and see more art, um, that would be great. And also just transparency, like, you know, we're dealing with this, we're having this com these conversations about the struggles and, you know, I think it's important for us to share with the visitors and the students that, like, we want to make things accessible and we are struggling and, like, you know, having conversations like these that um, welcome ideas and stuff like that, I also think is important. So, yeah, I kind of rushed through that, but <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jahari. That was awesome. So we are going to move to our next portion of our program together. So I would invite some questions from our audience members. Let me just stop sharing my screen. So I wonder, Sydney, if I could um, inquire if you could help us out with a couple yeah. questions that you've been reviewing during our fabulous presentations. Sure thing. Um, first, I would just like to introduce myself. My name is Sydney Bowden. I am the youth intern coordinator at the MFA. Um, I started as a teen arts council member when I was in high school and came back after I graduated college in 2018 and worked in membership, um, similar to Blair, and eventually worked my way out of membership and into the team programs um, sphere of the museum and I work with all the team programs including STEAM team, um, curatorial study hall, and TAC, Teen Arts Council. And the first question I see on here is for Blair. Um, would it be harder to sell a ticket for virtual exhibitions than in-person ones? Ooh, that is the Big question at the moment. I think museums across the world are wondering that. We're all thinking about how we can monetize our virtual programs and exhibitions. Um, and I think right now it's gonna be a lot of piloting and trial and error. 
Um, I think a lot of museums are going to start testing more paid virtual programs and there's talk of virtual membership models too. So I think um, I don't have the answer yet, but I think you'll see a lot in terms of charging for virtual over the next few months. Good question. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, the next question I see is for Liz. How is the graduate program in Latin Americas different from the graduate schools in the States? If you could please tell a little bit from your own perspective, I would much appreciate it. Sure. So the program that I attended at the Universidad de Chile, which is um, the best university in, in that country, it is an internationally accredited graduate um, program. All of their graduate programs, I believe, are. Um, so one thing that um, you definitely want to double check when you're exploring this is international accreditation um, because um, that is definitely something that might matter um, versus institutions in the states that um, certainly I believe all would, would have that. Um, so that's that's one possible difference between programs. Um, most, I, I believe that the education that I received abroad um, was incredibly high quality uh, with you know, academics who are really renowned in the region and, and beyond. Um, I would say, uh, as I mentioned a little bit, that the primary difference was being able to be in direct contact with a contemporary artist who um, formed my subject of research because I was focused on the 1980s and um, public art and performative art that took place in public space during the Pinochet dictatorship. And um, the archives that I was able to access were like under an artist's bed, you know, not, not yet in, in a library. Um, so for contemporary art in particular, I think that having um, more direct uh, access um, to um, what the subject one is engaged with um, is was really for me the main um, difference between um, studying in Latin America and studying in the U.S. and the price, of course, too. Don't forget, don't forget the price. That's really important. Thank you, Liz. So we have another question for Blair. Um, Blair, when looking for new corporate sponsors, how do you ensure MFA partners maintain ethical business practices and align with the MFA's own mission statement, commitment to inclusion and sustainability initiatives? Gosh, another great question and also a very big topic within um, philanthropy as a whole right now. Um, so I don't know how many people are aware of, but there have been a number of cases in the news. Um, in particular, the Tate um, had a long-term sponsorship with BP, the oil company, that um, there were a ton of protests about from the community in London. Um, and eventually the Tate ended their sponsorship after I think 22 years. And then here in the US, there's been a lot of activism um, with the Sackler family um, and Purdue Pharma because of the role that they played in the op opioid crisis and um, the number, they supported a number of arts organizations over the years. So there, that is a big topic right now as we're all thinking about who do we align ourselves with um, in terms of donations and branding. The key um, that a lot of museums are doing now is developing gift acceptance policies so written guidelines for staff to follow as they are um, going out and getting gifts, not only from companies, but also individuals, because um, that is a big piece of it too. And so we have a research team within development who looks into who our donors are, um, but also making sure that there's alignment across the organization. So not only do the staff all know what's appropriate and who we want to approach, but also our board of trustees. It's really critical um, that they are also in, uh, in aligned with what we're thinking as well. And so whenever there's been a question about a company, we take it to the board and we run it by them and we make sure everyone feels good. It's really helpful, thank you. I see a question for Jahari. Um, but it also says it's open to anyone. And I think this was said or typed a little after you might have mentioned this already, but how is the museum maintaining career development, networking and mentoring while working remotely? 
Um, for me, I mean, my internship specifically started in September, so I had quite a bit of time to hop around the museum and like just say hi to people um, and get to know them and what they do. There are still a lot of um, places in the museum and people in the museum that I was hoping to have conversations with. Um, I think because of COVID, there's, you know, attention is going a lot of different places. Um, but in terms of the people who I've already connected with and my supervisor specifically, um, we have regular check-ins and if there's any questions I have or any um, things I'm interested in or, you know, if there's something that I wanted to know more about, um, they're really good at making sure that I'm updated and um, if I needed to have a one-on-one, -on -one, then I can schedule that. Um, so I haven't really, I think that the only thing that makes it complicated is scheduling. I feel like even with school after COVID, the workload got a little heavy and I think, um, you know, transitionings are weird and things like that. So um, in terms of like meeting new people and stuff like that, it, it's, a hard, it's hard to get on people's schedules because everything is everywhere right now. Um, but in terms of the projects that I was already working on, I haven't, um, I haven't gotten like less involved at all, if that makes sense. Thank you. So we have a question for Jill. Um, Jill, um, this attendee is curious about the museum's lending policies to other countries. We know that historically disenfranchised countries, particularly those in the Global South, are often left out of the rotations of pieces and exhibitions. I'm wondering if the MFA has partnerships with museums in developing countries and what the MFA is doing to address these forms of exclusion. Good question. I would say that um, we, <laughs> Lately, we have been trying to do more with this. Um, you know, Liz can probably speak a little bit more to this, but I mean, we have lent to, um, we've just recently had a loan to a museum in Mexico City, and we've had loans to South America. Um, we've also borrowed um, from that area um, for the Made in the Americas exhibition. That was an interesting project that Dennis Carr did that was really interesting. Um, Liz, you did the CIFO show um, that was Latin American. We don't actually have any partnerships down there yet, but we don't do that type of partnership very often. We did the, the partnership in Japan. Um, that's sort of the major type of project that we do. Um, I think that we would be open to it. Um, I just, I, it's not something that I particularly get involved with. Um, so I can really only speak to the idea of, do we lend to, the, to uh, these countries that you've mentioned or do we borrow from them? And I would say we do both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question here for Liz. From a curatorial perspective, does the museum attempt to preserve performative art Beyond the, move, beyond the moment in which it occurs? And how would you present it to be public? In short, what are the curatorial challenges of curating performative art? Well, we definitely need a whole nother Zoom on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's a very good question, thank you. So um, there's many challenges, including um, you know, the requirements for um, hanging a painting on a wall is like keeping it in a climate controlled space and um, making sure there's not direct sunlight on it. Um, and I'm probably exaggerating how few requirements there are, but the requirements for working with a, a live artist are like, this person needs to eat, they need a hotel room, they need an honorarium, they might have collaborators, they, um, might, they need materials. Um, they're gonna do their work around other artworks in the museum. So our conservators have to be involved. Our exhibition team has to schedule the facilities. I mean, it just goes on and on. So it is um, incredibly complex, um, but worthwhile um, when you get to see the connections that are made um, between the audiences in this type of work. 
And in terms of preservation, um, there's many different perspectives in the field on this subject. Um, performance documentation is, I would say, pretty commonly displayed in museums as video or, um, you know, related ephemera photographs. I am really of the mindset that performance is best experienced um, in the, its originally intended format, um, which is, is live. Um, so in some cases, we have collected performance artworks, um, such as Amalia Pica's Podium Now Speak, which is currently on view um, in, well, sort of um, in the America's Wing on the third floor um, in our exhibition dedicated to women identified artists. Um, and that is a work that can be activated, that has a sculptural component, but that can be activated uh, by the public. So it's sort of an ongoing performance. So that sort of work um, that uh, involves public participation, we have collected. Um, and of course, when we collect a work, we um, remain dedicated to preserving it um, so that generations to come um, can experience it. Um, and then in terms of works that we don't uh, collect, uh, they exist primarily for us so far on our mfa.org performance art archive, um, where you can access um, video and photos and text on um, all of the past performances that we've organized. Thanks so much for the question. Thank, Thank you. you. That's great. Um, I have a question for Blair. Blair, what skills did you take from your frontline work experience that you now apply to working in corporate at the museum? That's such a good question. I guess, so a part of my job, I sold tickets at the front desk and memberships. And then um, for a part of my time, I, after that, I was the assistant director of the information center. So I was sort of, um, the person who anyone had a customer complaint, they would get directed to me, um, which was, <laughs> you learn a lot of life skills resolving customer service frontline issues. Um, but another big thing that I think about all the time is part of my job was people would come up and say, what should I see today? What's worth, you know, taking a, a look at? What are the exhibitions? Um, why should I visit them? And having to come up for the general public, I was an art history major and I sort of knew the academic side of it and we'd go to curatorial talks, but then how to translate that into why a person who maybe doesn't have a whole lot of knowledge about art, why they should care, why should they should be interested in going to see a certain exhibition and sort of what is the main thing that makes it really exciting. Um, being able to do that um, and finding ways to make exhibitions seem exciting or programs, public programs too, um, I started to think of myself as being like a liaison between the public and curatorial academic sides. Um, and that's something that I take into my job because I'm talking to business people um, and not art experts. So I'm saying this is why you should care about this show. This is why you should invest in it. And this is why I think your customers and your employees and your clients will also be impressed and, and happy that you're supporting this as well. So um, I think that's one of the big big skills that I learned. You learned how to do sales early on, right? And you're still doing it now. That's great. Thank you. Um, this question is not targeted towards any of the panelists in particular, but I think it's a great question for the younger audience. Um, what is needed to become an intern for a recent college grad with a bachelor's in history? Um, and I think just a recent college grad trying to break into um, the work world or the workforce in general is a daunting task. And if any of you have any um, insight or suggestions, advice. Maybe Dahlia could answer that actually. <laughs> um, yeah, because I feel like the future of our intern program um, you know, is, is shifting. Um, so I have my thoughts, but I feel like you should maybe answer first, if you don't mind, Dahlia. Not at all. No, I think it's really important to acknowledge that the museum is not a place for one particular type of major. I think that we very much, um, promote and understand art to be 
very widely considered a place and the museum to be a place of learning and of teaching. And so um, in the same way that one develops the kind of research and communication skills that are really foundational to understanding history and the nuances and ways in which history is, our histories are written and are not written, I think is really important to bring to the context of the museum. Um, and I think that the kinds of skills that humanities majors, but certainly across the board are gaining in school in terms of research skills, communication skills, um, certainly being able to think really critically, being able to see a topic, a question from multiple perspectives is really valuable in the context of cultural organizations. Um, certainly being able to work with folks from different perspectives as well is really, really important. Um, I would also add that while there are many opportunities, I think, in which students can gain those kinds of intellectual experiences and skills, it's also really important to be able to come to the uh, cultural organization with some really practical skills around how to navigate office spaces, how to communicate within an office setting, how to make a spreadsheet. Um, so some really practical skills, but also being able to um, explore particular issues from multiple perspectives and know that there isn't one way of looking at something, I think is really important. Thank you, I think that was a wonderful, I think that was a wonderful answer. Um, and I would just like to add that you should always, um, regardless of what you think you, um, you think your next step should be after graduating college. I know that time period, at least for me, was a very, um, a very stressful time in my life. Um, I think getting your foot into any institution or just meeting people that you think will help you in your future career plans is the best thing you could do in that time. Um, just making connections and being open to connections that you don't think that you would necessarily need, I think helped me a lot. Um, find a place for me in an institution I knew I always wanted to be in. Thank you, Sydney. So we have a question for Jill. Um, Jill, what are some of the projects that your previous interns in the registrar's office have worked on? And how do you think some of these will change with COVID? Well, I mean, we're having a hard time envisioning what our program's going to be post COVID just because we have a very small, very tight office and um, we we can't fit all of our registrars into our office and we're having a hard time figuring out how um, how we'll be able to continue with our interns. But we had some really great projects. We had one intern who came in and wrote a digital condition reporting app for us that was fantastic. We've had some other people come in and they've been scanning and digitizing our um, original MFA loan records, you know, these ancient books from 1876 that needed to be scanned and put into our database. Um, I've had interns helping me in the gallery. I, we make a point of that actually when the interns come in to be in the gallery and observing unpacking and packing, condition checking, that whole process. Um, we also train them very well in our database system, our um, uh, collections management system. So that's something that TMS is used across the museum um, industry. And so learning that is you know, very valuable for them. Um, I'm trying to think of some other fun projects. I had, we did a big Degas pastel show a couple of years ago, and there was a lot of um, concern about how we were gonna be moving pastels because it's an especially fragile medium. And so um, she took all the data from, you know, the objects and how they traveled and pulled all the information from the condition reports and sort of did a, um, you know, a presentation on, you know, uh, what type of crate was best for the objects and how did they travel safely. You know, it, it's, um, it varies uh, depending on the projects that we have in the office at the time. But I would say definitely the biggest things we try to do is make sure they understand the database and make sure that they get some exposure to projects that are happening around the building. Thank you, that's really helpful. This is a, 
this is another question that I feel all of you can answer. Um, what advice can you give to young women who face gender prejudices in the art world? The art world is still a men's club and in a lot of ways, even though it is working hard to represent different minorities and to face hard conversations. I can start. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, it's absolutely true. Um, it's really interesting because the uh, museum setting, I mean, we're, we're all women on this panel, right? Women identified people, not to make assumptions about our, our, um, our gender identifications, but I think I, I know most of you well enough um, to say that. And so there is definitely no lack of women workers at the MFA, and I think at mo in most museums, yet um, representation of women identified people in leadership is um, not as skewed uh, towards, towards women, right? Men are much more commonly in charge, and we see that um, at the director level um, more so than, than in any other role. Um, that is changing. And it will only change if we um, really become allies to each other. Um, and I would say for women um, in, uh, who, are, who are younger, just getting into um, the field, reach out to people who you think may not have time to talk to you. Um, the worst that could happen is they could say, you know, well, let's meet next year. Um, and maybe blow you off but probably they won't um, because mentorship and forging um, a strong network of people that you see yourself in um, is incredibly important um, so don't be shy i would say um, and invite people to lunch invite people to coffee and uh, make sure that um, you are really forging a space for yourself beyond your um, the immediate circle of your peers. Um, and then the second thing I would say is that um, there's a lot of calls for uh, reform to revolution um, in all of our institutions right now, um, obviously particularly around um, racial inequities. Um, but those calls um, really, up, I think, for equity across the board um, are only to benefit all of us. Um, so allying ourselves as women with these causes um, and supporting um, voices that really need to be heard right now, specifically black voices, um, I think is really very important um, now and, and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've got a question for Jahari, which is how do you manage how do you manage the mass art workload with an internship? How many days a week did you end up working at the museum? Um, so I work a day and a half, so about 12 hours um, a week. And yeah, <laughs> um, it was pretty, it wasn't hard for me um, to kind of work with my class schedule. Um, now that I'm an upper class, I mean, after your first year, you can kind of make your own schedule. So knowing that I wanted to do this internship, I kind of, um, worked around that and was able to, usually I don't want to have class on Friday anyway. Um, so that opened up space for me to work. Um, also there is a way to register your internship at MassArt specifically. So um, if you were having a hard time filling in your schedule at MassArt, you can kind of get permission to replace one of your classes with the internship. Um, and that just means that your supervisor at the museum has to be in contact with school to make sure you're actually working. Um, but it wasn't difficult. And I mean, like, I think that in terms of workload and like energy lasting, I think that because you know, I'm passionate about what I'm doing and it aligned with, you know, what I'm learning at MassArt. I mean, I am an artist, but I was, um, 
learning about conservation and I joined a conservation class. And so kind of the conversations that I was having overlapped um, with the conversations I was having at the museum. So in terms of energy in, in, in the workload, it wasn't really hard to transition um, because of that overlap and because of, you know, I was motivated to go to work every day. Um, so that made it a little easier. That's great, thank you. And I think I see one more question that um, we could all answer. How does the museum encourage interdepartmental unity? Oh, sorry. First, the commenter um, made a comment saying that it seems like everyone in this panel gets along. <laughs> um, how does the museum encourage interdepartmental unity? Is there an example of a project that required collaboration with many departments? How do you make these projects more successful? Um, and I'm open to answer one of these questions. Um, I work with teens and I have one of the easiest jobs where everyone wants to work with me and my teens. Um, they bring great uh, insight and they are a creative and um, lovely bunch of uh, young people. So that's very easy on my end. And um, I wonder how the rest of the panelists get to uh, work with others in their daily jobs. Monica, what do you think from your perspective? I was just gonna say, <laughs> so with the artist project, um, you know, obviously we're working with educators and these kids are creating their own types of works. And then at one day we have it installed in this gorgeous gallery. So who's gonna help us out? So we end up, um, what we do is we collaborate with the design departments and then some of the curatorial uh, departments um, in terms of connecting that particular piece of work with a modern piece of work that is going to work hand in hand with the artist project as a whole. And so there are those, there's that constant uh, communication between the design departments, curatorial, as well as, um, as well as the installation crew. You know, we're thinking about like right now, for example, like uh, exchange, exchange codes, um, that's the one that's coming up this this year. Um, so we're dealing with con wood contractors um, as well. So there's there's a lot of departments that are in hand and, and we're in communications with. So there's that opportunity in our in our site. Thank you. Generally speaking, I would say the museum is a pretty collaborative place, and that is both. Um, certainly by necessity, but it's also a real perk in terms of getting to know what other people in the museum do on a regular basis and how um, we all work together for the same, toward the same mission and for the same values. So um, that, that's what I would say to that. Just to add in, we have a five, word, uh, five phrase word pairings um, that have guided all of our work through our strategic plan over the past few years which let's see if I can remember all of them. Um, invite boldly, welcome warmly, engage deeply, collaborate generously, and collect purposefully. So that is supposed to be guiding all of that and you can see collaboration is at the very heart of it. I will say though, um, I enjoy even situations like this where I get to meet new people. Uh, you know, it, you can get a little siloed at the museum. We all work on projects and we get to know those people, but um, it's, it is nice to um, participate in something like this and get to meet new people. And, uh, you know, I think we all wish we could do that a little bit more. It's been very busy at the museum um, pre-COVID. And so I think um, something that has come out of all of this is the ability or the thought that um, it would be nice to break down some of those silos and spend more time with each other. Definitely an upshot of feeling so disembodied, right? It's yeah. been ways in which we can find new and creative ways of working together. Yeah. So we've got a couple of minutes left and um, there is a question for you, Jill, related to travel as your role as a registrar. So can you share with us if there is any travel involved, um, how much do you travel and how do you anticipate that'll be really impacted now? Uh, so there is, when, 
most of the time when a work of art travels, um, there is somebody from the museum who accompanies it as a courier. That can be a curator, conservator, uh, preparations person, or a registrar. So there is a lot of, well, not a lot, but there is travel involved. Um, I'm able to sort of determine my schedule. I get to travel as much as I want to or not. Uh, if I have a particular project that I'm working on that involves an exhibition traveling around to various different venues, then I would travel with it. Uh, that, as I said, is a, one of the conundrums of this new world that we're living in, is trying to figure out how are we going to do that, um, because travel is either forbidden or it's not safe. Uh, one of the things we're talking about is perhaps hiring um, you know, people in at the different venues to do the work that we would normally do. Uh, but it's all brand new and we're trying to figure it out. But I must say, I will miss not, tra I will miss traveling because it's, it's, it is um, one of my favorite parts of the job. Yeah, I think we're all going to be learning many new things about our roles mm. at the museum together. So I just want to uh, wrap up by saying thank you very, very much to all of our panelists and Thank you, Sydney, uh, my co-presenter here. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. I know we didn't get a chance to get to every single one of the questions, but we will keep a transcript of the questions. And so if we can find a way to respond, uh, we certainly will do so. And please stay tuned. Uh, we have more opportunities for students to engage with the museum. So if you're interested in learning more about how we're having conversations about this moment um, and the role that art and design play in it, please visit our website, uh, mfa.org, and go to the college programs link. Go certainly learn a lot from our teen programs as well as from our college programs. Um, so have a look, enjoy, and thank you to everybody again for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.